So I'm here with Dr. Andrew Newberg, who's a globally renowned neuroscientist and also the director of research at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health here at Thomas Jefferson University. He's here as a keynote speaker at our Mind Body Medicine Conference. Dr. Newberg, welcome. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks, it's great to be here. So one of the topics that you covered today is spirituality, meditation, and the effects on the brain. And since you're an expert on brain imaging and how the brain responds to different things, tell us a little bit about this research. Well, I think uh, the most important thing is, is that we can use brain imaging to study people while they are engaged in different spiritual practices, meditation, prayer, and so forth. And we can see the changes that are going on in the moment that they're doing a particular practice, how it's affecting them, how it's affecting their emotions, their thoughts, their feelings, and so forth. But we can also look at the long-term effects, which to me is very important, especially from a health-related perspective, that if somebody says, I, I want to try to improve my health and well-being, uh, should I do a meditation practice? Well, if you do that, how is that going to affect you over a long period of time? And we can use a lot of very high-tech brain imaging studies to actually be able to demonstrate what areas of the brain are affected and how they are changed over time and how that correlates with their health. What are the type of brain scans that you use? So we've used a variety of different types of brain scans to study spiritual practices and meditation practices. We've used um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. We use positron emission tomography, PET imaging. We use um, single photon emission computed tomography, SPECT imaging. And these are just all different ways of trying to get at how the brain is working. So for example, if you do an MRI study, we're using big magnets to be able to look at how the brain is functioning and we can put somebody into the scanner while they're doing a meditation practice, for example, and we can have them do the practice and see what's happening, what's changing in their brain. Or perhaps since we know that practices like meditation can help to reduce stress or anxiety, we can actually put them into the scanner and give them some kind of stressor task. We can make them feel stressed by having them do something and see if they react to it differently because they've been doing a meditation practice before and after that. Uh, we can also do the other two types of imaging, PET and SPECT imaging, which involve injecting some kind of radioactive tracer that helps us to see some part of the body or the brain's physiology. And sometimes we do that to look at things like different neurotransmitters. So we've done studies where we can look at dopamine and serotonin. And again, always looking at the changes that occur as a result of these spiritual practices. So what are some of the take homes from all this research you've been doing? Well, I, I think one of the most important take-home messages is that there isn't just one part of our brain that turns on when we meditate or turns on when we engage our spiritual selves. In fact, if you think about it, when, when people are spiritual, they have different emotions, they have different thoughts, they can feel things in their body, they can sense things, they can see things. So you would think that it would involve a lot of different parts of the brain, and that's exa ex exactly what we see. When people engage in prayer, meditation, Many different parts of the brain turn on, areas like the frontal lobe that help us to concentrate, the limbic system that helps us with our emotional responses, the sensory areas. So if there's a part of ourselves that's the kind of the spiritual part, it, it's really all of us. It's all the different parts of the brain. And we also know in the, in the world of integrative medicine that the brain is deeply connected to the body. So when you do a practice like meditation or prayer, not only are there changes going on up in the brain, but that's translated into how the body feels and it affects our immune system, it affects inflammation in the body, and for the most part, it's always helping us to be healthier. So you're able to make correlations in what you see on the brain scans to other things you're measuring in the body, other health indices, other blood markers, and things like that? Correct, so we can actually look at not just what we see in the brain and we can say, oh, okay, well, it looks like the brain was regulating its emotions better because the frontal lobe was talking to the emotional centers and keeping them calm. But then we can ask people, well, how do you feel? Are you feeling less stressed? Are you feeling less anxious? And they can say, yes, I, I have. And so they, they measure on subjective scales much lower in terms of their, their anxiety, their stress, their depression. But we can even look at other physiological markers. So we can look at stress hormones like cortisol and we can find out that they're reduced when people are doing these practices. And we can even see how the immune system is reacting. And we know, for example, that when people engage in meditation, it actually helps the immune system to work more actively. In fact, one study was done that showed that when people received a vaccine, like a flu vaccine, their body produced more antibodies in response when they were meditating compared to when they weren't. A lot of people, when they hear data like this, think, 
oh, this must mean that I have to meditate for hours a day. That's too burdensome. I can't do that. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's a very important point, I think, that people also need to, to realize, which is that while a lot of the studies that we have done and other people have done show that when you do a practice for a long period of time and for even you know, many minutes or hours a day, it seems to have its biggest effect, that doesn't mean that doing practices for a small, brief periods of time has no effect. In fact, actually, the data also shows that even if you were to just sit at your desk and, sp and spend 30 seconds just focusing on your breath or just trying to relax your body, that can actually have a very profound effect on your brain and also on the rest of your body. So when people think about meditation, uh, while yes, you know, the more is better to a certain extent in terms of the overall impact, that doesn't mean that people can't do various short-term kinds of meditation practices, focusing on their breath, focusing on an object, saying a little prayer that has meaning to them. And that can have a very big effect, especially if they're about to go and do something that's stressful, maybe something at work or dealing with a family member. I think that's so important that just a few minutes a day can have a big impact. And then you can increase it from there if, if you feel you can. Exactly. And, and I think the, the other important thing is, is that there are thousands of different kinds of meditation practices. So if somebody tries something and they, it feels weird or they don't like it or it doesn't, you know, just doesn't seem to jive with the way they are, that doesn't mean that no meditation will work. They just need to find one that will work. Almost everybody can respond to a kind of practice. It's a matter of finding the right one. Now, there are obviously very well-known ones that people can try to do, like mindfulness, and, and they're well-known because it works for a lot of people, and that can be a good starting point. But if somebody, if you find something isn't working, then what I always recommend people do is, is do some homework, look up some other practices, try something online, try an app, and find the one that works best for you because that's the one that you're going to be able to engage better, and that's the one that's going to have the biggest effect for you. And it seems from your studies that you get similar results if you're more of a religious person and prefer to pray. A absolutely. So uh, what we keep finding is, is that the more you are engaged in any practice, the more it has a, an impact on you. And so if you are a religious or spiritual person, turning to a practice that you know and love and that you like to do, if you're Catholic, do the rosary. Uh, uh, if you're a, a Jewish or Muslim and you like to pray every day, then do those prayers. All of that can actually have a very beneficial effect for you, it, it, but it really it becomes more meaningful to you because it's a part of your tradition. So it, I think it's always worth a person thinking about what practices are part of their own tradition that they come from, that they feel comfortable with, that they've done before, and, and which also is an important point because if you've been doing them since you're a child, those neural connections that support that, that practice, they're really ingrained within you. They're built in, and so they're going to have a more profound effect than starting something new that you've never tried before. Sometimes you need to try something new because you just don't like the things that you've done before. But if you do, then it's, it's great to be able to fall back on the practices that you know and love. It reminds me of that experiment you and I did where you put me in the scanner and I listened to just a little bit of a Qigong meditation that I do and engaged in that meditation. And how dramatically my brain changed from its stressed state of listening to the events of the day to just a few minutes, just a few minutes made such a difference. Exactly. And, and uh, that's one of the nice things about doing the MRI studies, as you said, and we, when we had you go in, I mean, it's amazing that within a couple of minutes, you can see these very profound changes. If you continue to do the practice, it is something that can persist. And what we've also shown is that it does persist beyond just the time that you're doing it. And that's why when we were talking about you only have to do a practice for a few minutes, that could still last you for a half hour, an hour beyond that even though you're only doing the practice for a short term. And I was really intrigued by some of the recent data that you've presented that in elderly populations, if people combine meditation with exercise, they get greater effects in terms of their blood vessels and everything like that than doing, say, exercise alone. Well, I, I think the most important point is that, that you know, no matter how old you are, Picking up a meditation practice can ultimately be beneficial, even if you're in your 70s or 80s. And uh, as you mentioned, the study that we did really showed that, that when people did meditation, and specifically when they combined meditation with exercise, it had a synergistic effect. It looks like that had a more powerful effect. And in many ways, that makes sense from an integrative medicine model, because we talk about the biological, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. So if you're, if you're engaging more than one of those parts of who you are, that's going to have that much bigger of an effect. Doing the exercise is great because it's getting more oxygen to all of your systems. It's getting your heart beating. 
and you're going to be more active. Lots of research has shown that that's beneficial. Meditation has been shown to be beneficial. And then when you bring them together, uh, as you mentioned, we're showing, showing changes going on in the brain, in the blood vessels, in the blood flow that's going to the brain. It really seems to have a very powerful and very positive effect for people. Well, Dr. Newberg, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I always learn something. Well, thank you.